church. If you have your Bibles or a copy of God's Word, would you go with me to 1 Thessalonians chapter 2 and find verse 13. We look at Thanksgiving this month and what it means to be thankful, to give thanks, to have a heart of gratitude, to learn how to appreciate not just the big things or the things that we hope for that perhaps we'll die in search of, but it's the little things. Somebody once told me, and I've said numerous times, if you got somebody who loves you and you have a place to stay and something to eat, and you got Jesus in your heart, you're the richest person on planet Earth. Our view is everything, our perspective, how we look at things. And I understand that we sometimes categorize those as negative and positive things, good and bad. Um, but the thing we have to understand in this month as we go into this together is that may God shape and mold inside of every one of us a heart of thanksgiving, that we give thanks and that we praise and we have to be able to do that, even in tough times. Uh, I refer to Mr. Andy Prosser a lot. But I want to share with you as I open up into this what he told me Wednesday night at the, I guess, the conclusion of our gathering around the pig picking and the packing of the bags that were handed out for yesterday. Uh, as he met me in the hall, he said, and you know that he has stage four cancer. And he met me in the hall and he said, I want to talk to you a minute. And I said, yes, sir. And he said, is it bad to pray that Jesus will come get me? And I said, not at all. I said, uh, I, I pray for that myself. Uh, I pray for the Lord's return to go be with him. That's ultimately what I desire. And... He said, okay, he said, I just wanted to make sure. And it was a very sincere, very good question. And uh, he said, now, you know, I want you to preach my funeral. And I said, yes, sir. I said, what would you like for me to say? What would you like for me to do? Is there anything that stands out that you would like for me to say about you or to the people that may be in attendance? And he said, just that, that I, I love the Lord. And one common thread since he's, Develop this condition is, he said, I'd rather hurt at church than to hurt on my couch. And that's certainly something we will echo even now and when that service will come and long after you with the Lord. I said, but now get this. I said, now death knows no age. I said, you may very well attend my funeral. Uh, I said, because you never know. And I said, so whether you get there or I get there first, tell the Lord in person that I love him and that I'm thankful for what he's done for me and doing for me. And so we kind of made that pact, you know, that we would do that. Um, because obviously we can tell the Lord right here, right now, and he knows the words in our mouth and the meditation of our hearts and minds. But to be able to see him in person is unlike anything else. And so just being thankful and humble, you know, we're supposed to come into his courts, into his church, into his presence, you know, with praise, thanksgiving. Some of you had some maybe incredibly bad weeks. Uh, it just seemed like it was Monday every day. But God is still good. Um, some of you are sick and you have conditions that I just want to go ahead and tell you something th this morning. And I don't want to discourage you, and nor should you ever stop praying, because it is hope that holds us together. But some of you will die in the condition that you pray for deliverance from. And then you will be delivered. Healing not always is on this side. But I promise you, healing will come. And so, we're thankful. Now, we can choose to live out the rest of our lives negative and sourpuss and 
feel like that, you know, everybody's against us and we're the only one this way. Or you can learn to live like a Christian and rise far above all these things that are beneath you and should not be above you. The only reason it's above you and the only reason you stand in its shadow is because you choose to. Because I've heard of a song that says he has. He is uh, victorious and that he has already won the war. Now battle we must attend. And like someone told me this past week, we owe him a death. But we also owe him our lives. So death will come. But may we live until we die. But but live how he intended for us to live. <clears throat> and I'm going to just tell you something, and we'll, we'll dig on in. You cannot complain and be thankful at the same time. So you make a choice of how you want to end the rest of your life, whether it be a day or whether it be a hundred. Learn how to be thankful. And if God can take us and dial us right on in to us seeing what we have instead of looking for what we don't, that process will begin here now. So look at 1 Thessalonians chapter 2 and look at verse 13. Paul writes for this cause that's a mouthful right there also thank we God without ceasing <clears throat> because when ye receive the word of God which ye heard of us ye received it not as the word of men but as it is in truth the word of God which effectually worketh also in you Get this, that believe. For ye, brethren, <clears throat> became followers. Notice that, that verb, that, that action. As Paul writes this to the church of Thessalonica, and these Thessalonians are, are hearing this letter with great anticipation. It says that you became followers in the beginning part of verse 14 of the churches of God, which in Judea are in Christ Jesus. For ye also have suffered like things of your own countrymen, which means this were people that were close to them, family, friends, neighbors even, even as they have of the Jews, who both killed the Lord Jesus, talking about the crucifixion, and their own prophets and have persecuted us, and they please not God. You know, I'd hate to know that I was living a life that would not please my Creator, my Savior, and my Redeemer, and are contrary to all men. Perhaps you've run into Mr. or Mrs. Contrary in your life. Verse 16, forbidding us to speak to the Gentiles that they might be saved. To fill up their 
sins always, for the wrath is come upon them to the uttermost. But we, brethren, being taken from you for a short time, in presence but not in heart, endeavored the more abundantly to see your face with great desire. Wherefore, we would have come unto you, even I, Paul, once again, but Satan hindered us. For what is our hope? And you have to understand when he phrases in verse 19, for what is our hope, he's not talking about in this statement our hope as Christians, as the church, but he's saying what is the hope of myself, Silas, and Timothy, who shared the word. with them and they have become their disciples because of the word of God so he says what is our hope what is mine and Silas and Timothy's hope and people like us he said our hope or joy or crown of rejoicing or not even ye in the presence of our Lord Jesus Christ at his coming. For ye, notice this, for you are our glory and our joy. Strong people make strong churches. But there's a reason that we are strong. We don't just get that way. We don't just become that. But there's a reason that you are strong. There are traits here in this passage that I think everyone should see. The first trait of a strong church is the word of God. In verse 13, let's go back to that rich, rich verse. And he says, for this cause also thank we God or thank God without ceasing. So there's a reason there. Now, now relate with Paul for a moment. Have you ever uttered these words? And now just think back for a minute, what caused you to thank and rejoice and to repetitively say those words? It was something that was overwhelming to you. It was something that was bigger than life. You know that extra hour we got last night? I, when I was up early this morning, I said, man, I am never going to make it through this thing just because of how it was. But I guess what overwhelms me is that God has actually created people and called them to do great things for him. And that to know today that Paul writes and says, for this cause, I've got to thank God. And I do it without ceasing. And it's in Paul's mind, in his heart, he's saying, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. Because 
what he is experiencing is bigger than his own life. Bigger than any goal he ever set for himself. Bigger than any ambitious thought he ever shared with anybody. He says, now get this, watch this. He says, let me tell you why I'm saying Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. He says, and he tells us in verse 13, he says, because. He said, because when you received, the word, <laughs> he's, <clears throat> he said, picture this. That some man or some woman thought that the word of God actually change somebody's can you see the missionary today the one who stands in Brazil who says, I'm only here because I feel like I have a treasure. And if I can share it with these foreign people, it can bring light to the dark. And it could save the lost. Can you see the one that is standing in Florence South Carolina today saying, I believe, I believe that the word of God can actually change people. That this is more than someone just toting it or laying it near their bed but they believed it with all of their heart and their soul. That they actually put all their chips in, that they believe in the risk that the Word of God, if only the Word of God could be communicated and conveyed from me to them, that something awesome could happen. He says, because when you watch, receive it. See, everybody who hears the word don't receive the word. See, you get, that's what commercials are on TV. They're always trying to get you to buy in or receive what they're trying to sell. 
just because you hear the commercial, just because it's in your living room, doesn't mean you bought into it. Your Bible is the same way, just because it's in your living room. Just because it echoes in the walls of your home doesn't mean that you've received it. It doesn't mean that you've bought into it. But it means you're holding back for some reason. You've got reservations for some reason. You're holding back because you've not bought into to what he is trying to sell you. So make no mistake, just because it sits in your home and echoes through the halls of your home, don't believe that you've received it. You can tote this all the way to hell. This won't save you but the offer of this book. I love what verse 13 says. It says that, which you heard of us. <laughs> hey, isn't it right what they say? Unless they hear it, they'll never have faith. It means if people like us stop sharing it with people like them, it will die with us. But somebody's got to go. Somebody's got to do it. I love how the people received it. Man, these people didn't know Jesus. They didn't even know how to spell his name. They didn't know anything. But all because of Paul and Silas and Timothy. They said, we've got to go to Thessalonica. We've got to get to those people because they will never Oh, well, I hope that God would birth that into the hearts of the people in this very congregation. That the word of God would not only just be a commercial advertisement in your life, that it would become something that you are well acquainted with and have invested in all your life. Look at verse 14 when he says the church. For ye, brethren, became followers of the churches of Christ. Notice that there's a pursuit after their conversion. He says that even in Judea or, or in, in Christ Jesus, for ye also have suffered like things of your own countrymen. He says even some of your own families, your moms, your dads, and he said people like that have turned against you and laughed at you and mocked you and picked fun, and, and they've even told you that if you go this route, they're never going to talk to you again. You're never welcome in their home or in their community anymore. He says that there's opposition, but they stood together. Notice the acquaintance that they make in verse 14 when it says, that you became followers of the church of God and that even in Judea are in Christ Jesus. He says that you have now taken and acquainted yourself. See, it's like this. When we stand together, we are the church. The walls do not define us. Um, we're the church. But this is the mentality that the church is supposed to have. That, see, as we read on through this passage and, and God speaks to our hearts, he, he says that, that they receive the word not just because Paul and Silas and Timothy were teaching and preaching. It says, but they received the word because it was the truth. 
See, that means something greater than just willing people happened. It meant that there was the power of God that actually spoke to their hearts and they received it not just because they spoke it, but because what they were saying was the truth. So it would be in short form like this. If the Bible says, forgive your brother, then it's the truth. Then we should try it on. We should put it into play. But this should be illustrated like this. Satan came and he puts up a roadblock. People do what they do. People are going to be people. Listen, you just got to love them. Because I'm telling you, it would be e easiest to be a, a serial killer if you just didn't have God in your life. Amen? I mean, really. Really? I mean, just deliver those people from that person and let us move on. But we let God help us. But see, here's the way we should be. See, people will be people and Satan will always be Satan. Even till his final judgment to when he is placed in the bottomless pit forever. See, the way I've got to act is this. This is my brother. You are my sister. We are family. And so we are a church. And see, there's a connection in this church because Paul says, he said, I can't wait to see your face. You got to remember, this is not happening in person. This letter is written because he can't get to them right now. Between things that have happened, Satan has hindered. But he sends them this letter to express to them what's going on, let of the Spirit of God. But see, if see, and this is what happens. Somebody wants to get to Eric. It shouldn't be like I see at times and say, here he is. But it should be like this. You want him? Then you gotta go through me. Not here he is. But see, people don't realize that because, see, what happens is somebody talks about him. You're talking about me. You're talking about me. You're talking about him. Now, this thing's getting real personal quick, fast, and hurry. Can you stand what's coming your way? Because the Bible just said there's a severe wrath coming to those who stand in the way. You think you've suffered long. You've not suffered long yet. You think you've been in agony. You think you've saw, you've met sorrow. You've yet to be personally introduced to them by Jesus. Thank you, Eric. You can be seated. Let's give Eric a hand. Verse 15, who both killed the Lord Jesus and their own prophets and have persecuted us and they please not God and are contrary to all men, forbidding us to speak to the Gentiles. Notice this, because they knew what they were saying could save them. <laughs> Boy, that's good stuff right there. Tell me, if what we've got is not worth having, then why do Satan and all of hell fight us so strongly? <laughs> it says, look on in verse 16, forbidding us to speak to the Gentiles that they might be saved, to fill up their, sinful, their sins always, for the wrath is come upon them to the uttermost. But look at the gospel. It says here that, these traits are, we have first the word of God. The second trait is the connection to the church. So you've got the word of God, the connection to the church, but the second one is speaking the gospel. I will say this, if we will start filling our mouths with the gospel, 
as much as some of the other things we talk about. Those nearly 3,000 people that you saw yesterday will only be a drop in the bucket of what can be saved and won to Christ before he comes and before he calls. You know, it's kind of remarkable when you put it into biblical perspective. Those people that you seen yesterday, not all at once, but collectively, was what they saw saved in Acts chapter 2 in one day. <laughs> and to think that our God is not the same as Hebrews 13, 8 tells us, the yesterday, today, and forever. Man, he's the same. He's still saving people. He's still changing lives, and I thank him so much for it. I'm thankful for our teachers and for our preachers and for our ministers of the gospel that knowing without you and what you do, it would die with us. And then how would my grandchildren that are not born yet be saved? There's a beautiful picture I want to leave you with here. <clears throat> There's the trait of fellowship that you find in verse 17. If you will look at it with me, notice, what, look, notice the fellowship between the believers. Now, he didn't say clicks. He didn't say rich. He didn't say poor. He didn't say yellow, red, white, black, male, female. But he said in verse 17, but we, brethren, being taken from you for a short time. Notice this, in our presence, but not in heart. Learn this. The people in this church should always be in your heart. People ask me all the time. And listen, I'm not going to get it right. I'm going to fail. Now, I've wiped snot up here so much, do not shake my hand at the end. You can get an air hug or a, I've kept it on this side of the knuckles, so I can give you that. How do you remember those names? <clears throat> if you spend any length of time with me, and please be generous with not a whole lot of amens. If you spend a whole lot of time with me, I don't have what it takes. But I know one who does. She is... <laughs> It's easy to remember people's names when you pray for them. Because when you're praying, you're talking to the one who knows every one of them by name. You want to know how to remember names? Just pray for them. That's the key. Because what is dealt and done with the Lord will never be forgotten. There was just connection. <laughs> he said, I'm not with you now. Physically, he said, but I promise you, there's never been one moment that you were not in my heart. Do you know those soldiers who serve this great nation? I'll guarantee you there's never a moment that their families are not in their hearts. And that's all they have to hold on to when they're there serving. That's what wakes them up in the morning. And keeps them going through the day. It's what's in their heart. 
<laughs> he says, but notice this second part. It says, but we endeavor the more abundantly. Listen, there was a, some extra effort put into it. I give him a little bit more than I gave him yesterday. And, but I can't wait to see your face again. That's strong. You know, if somebody told you on your lowest point in life, and they told you, and you hadn't seen them in a while, they said, I'm sending word to you. I can't wait to see your face one more time. You know what that would do for you? Man, that would lift your spirit. He'd say, but if not, but one more time. How many people have gone on before you that if you could just one more time? And he says, that's the kind of love that should be in the church. I can't have much more of this stuff. Let's land the plane. He said, in verse 18, wherefore we would have come unto you already. We'd already be with you. But Satan has put a roadblock. And he's hindered us. He says, but we're coming. <laughs> he says, for in verse 19, for what is our hope? What helps me? What is a trait? He says, but to be able to see you and to have the hope and the joy and the crown of rejoicing are not even ye in the presence of the Lord Jesus Christ at his coming. And this is what he says. He says that everybody that <laughs> get this. He says that everyone that you've ever served with in this endeavor, for everyone you've ever led to Jesus, and introduced him to Jesus personally, he says, let me introduce you to the one who saved you. He said right here that when we get to heaven at the appearing of Jesus, that all those people that you influenced, all of those people that you shared the word with, all of those people, you will be standing there and he's going to introduce them and he's going to say, everybody that Charles Gray influenced, step forward. Everyone who saw Tran and drew strength from her perseverance in her faith. Step forward. Everybody who has ever seen that, everybody who has ever will stand there and is appearing and there will be a crowd. Church, let me say, if we won't give him thanks right here, I promise you, you won't give him thanks when you're in the world. Know this, no matter what happens, I love you. And I'm thankful for every life that God 
is allow me to touch. And I don't have to sit and wonder if it will echo in eternity. But this that I hold is the truth. And I already know that it will. And whether I see you again on this side or on the next, we will stand together in the presence of the Lord. And we will forever thank the Lord. May we start by standing this morning.